Hi, I'm Valentina V and welcome to my Premiere Pro Jumpstart course. This course I designed specifically for people who have either never edited before or for people who are new to Premiere Pro. Maybe you're moving from a different program. You want to know how to use Premiere Pro. We will cover everything you need to know to get started with Premiere Pro. You're probably wondering, can you do it in three hours? Is it even possible? Yes, it's possible. Of course, we're not going to cover every tiny little minute detail, but we will be covering enough to be able to edit two videos. One that is more of a basic, straightforward edit with just music and graphics, and one that's actually throwing in sources from three different cameras and a separate audio source. So hopefully by the end, you'll have everything you need for success. I will be providing you with the project assets so that you can take them and use them and follow along. You can also follow along using the notes that I provide you in the Jumpstart PDF. That'll have everything that I'm talking about with all of the detailed descriptions, all of the shortcuts, everything you need. So go ahead and download that PDF from the description and just follow along with me. My aim for this guide is for it to be simple enough for you to be able to follow along, for it to be enjoyable, and for you to feel like you're having fun and learning at the same time. I've made these example videos myself, pretending that I have a cooking YouTube channel, when in reality, I hardly cook. I know maybe like three dishes, and I am highly uncomfortable in front of the camera, but uh, hopefully you won't be able to tell. Just a few basic things to know before we get started. To play and pause a video, I press the space bar. To zoom into the timeline and out of the timeline, I'm not necessarily always going down at the bottom. I am also using Alt and scrolling on my mouse to go in and out of the timeline. And to scroll side to side, I actually have a side scroll wheel on my mouse. But if you don't have one of those, you can always just grab this bottom bar and pull it right to left. So that's how you navigate your timeline and how you play your timeline. Your current time indicator, which is this blue line, is going to show what point in your timeline you're at at any time. We'll talk about this later in more detail, but that's basically how Premiere works, right? You have a timeline here. You take this blue line to go around the timeline to see different things. And then whatever those things are, they pop up here in the program window. You can zoom into and out of the timeline. You can go side to side on the timeline. And to play and pause, you just press the space bar. Let's go to the tutorial. So here we are, we just opened Premiere Pro and the first thing you're gonna see is your recent projects over here. If you don't see anything, that means you don't have any recent projects and you can either start a project or open a project. Don't worry about all this other stuff down here and all this stuff and any of this. You can take tutorials if you wanna learn, but you're already watching a tutorial. So you can either start a new project or open a project, but before we go ahead and do any of that. Let's take a look at the file organization that we have on our computer or on our hard drive because that's where the edit starts actually. It's not within Premiere Pro. It is with how you organize your files. So this is how I would typically organize one of my hard drives. What I do is I'll organize it by the date. So it is the year, the month, the day, and then underscore what it is. So if we go to the food show folder, you'll see I have it categorized by footage, audio, graphics, music, photos, documents, premiere, Adobe After Effects, and exports. Now, I don't use all of these for every single project that I do. In fact, you can see here, for example, photos, this is empty. Uh, documents, this is empty. What I do every time I start a new project is I have this uh, new name kind of placement template project, template folder. And inside of there are those template folders. So every time I start a new project, I'll just copy paste these template folders into a new main folder. And that way everything always is organized for me. So 
this is what the food show folder looks like and you are going to get the footage and the audio and the exports folders when you download the assets. The footage folder has camera A, camera B, camera C. And if you open up each of these, what you'll see is some clips and they are uh, named after the videos that we will be making. So you can see here we have several files that are egg cooker files, and then we have a few tuna salad files. And you can see that each of them has underscore A written on it, which means this is the A camera. I renamed all these files using Adobe Bridge, which I have a tutorial on at the Adobe Care YouTube channel, Tips and Tricks Tuesdays, if you wanna check it out. But I won't be covering it here, just letting you know that this is what the files look like, right? So I named it by what the date is, what the video is, uh, what camera it is, and then what the clip is. And you'll see that all three of these are from different cameras. So this camera was naming clips using this C under, uh, C0004. Uh, this camera was the X-T3, I believe, or X-T4, no, X-T3. So you can see the name of the camera, X-T3, and then the numbers follow that. And then camera C was uh, another Sony camera, so it goes by C underscore C, right? And again, you have this tuna salad and the egg cooker. This you'll be able to tell because you'll know which clips need to be used for the tuna salad video and which clips need to be used for the egg cooker video. Then here in audio, uh, we have H4N, that is the audio recorder that I was using. We have music, which we won't be using the music folder because I can't actually deliver music assets to you. So you can either use your own music or you can use music from the Adobe Stock Store. Sound effects, which I have a couple bloops and swooshes from Sound Bible, uh, which you can download yourself if you'd like. And then voiceover, I don't have anything for voiceover. So you will be getting the H4N folder, which has all of the uh, recorder audio, and it's called mono dash whatever it is. So that is what you'll get with your assets as well. So now that we're back in Premiere Pro, let's go ahead and say new project. And the first thing it's gonna ask you is where do you wanna put this project folder? And what do you wanna name your project? So we will name it, let's name it um, Valentina Food Show. And then the location, now for every single project, I make a new Premiere Pro folder. So in this case, if we go to Food Show, you see how before we had footage, audio graphics, yada yada, it's the Premiere folder and that is what we are selecting, right? And then we press Select Folder. So our new project and all of the assets that Premiere Pro generates, like the preview files, um, the cached files, they're all going to go in there. Don't worry about what any of that is. All you have to do is check over here under scratch disks and make sure that everything is set to same as project. That means that all of these things, captured video, captured audio, previews, everything will go into that same Premiere folder on your device. And then click OK. So here is your default uh, Premiere Pro project and this is what it looks like. If yours doesn't look like this, you can go up here to the editing tab and click on the three button menu and go to reset to saved layout. And that is gonna be the reset. Now this is your source. That is where all of your clips will be played. And this is where you can preview your clips before putting them onto your timeline. This is your program monitor. That is where you will be able to see what your working project looks like. This is your project window over here. That is where you can put all of your clips and all of your assets and organize everything. And this right here is your timeline. That is 
where you're going to be building your project. Over here, you have your toolbar, which I use quite a lot, but I actually use shortcuts, so I don't have to go over here and click the tools. But what's fun is when you go over to the tools and you hover over them, you can see what the shortcut is. Selection tool is V, track select forward tool is A, ripple edit tool is B, etc., etc. You also have your volume or decibel scale right here, and it is going to help you determine how loud your video is. I tend to not trust my own ears because maybe my headphones or my computer is too loud or too quiet. So I like to just make sure that my video never peaks, never goes into the red areas, is always kind of staying around negative 12 on this scale. So now it's time to bring clips and media into our project so that we can start organizing it and then editing with it. You can either double click in the project window and that pulls up uh, the dialogue and you can just select things and import them. You can also do this by going to file import. But my favorite way of doing this, since I've already organized them into folders, is I'm going to drag and drop them from my file navigator. So I'll go here to food show footage and I will drag this entire footage folder over into my project window. The entire folder. And you can see there that folder is right there. Now inside of Premiere Pro this is what is called a bin, right? A bin and a folder are the same thing. And inside this bin now we have cam A, cam B, and cam C. And you can see that they are all here and they are all inside each of these bins. I can also drag in that audio folder or I can make my own bins and my own organization within Premiere Pro by just going down here to new bin. So if I click that, it creates a new bin and I can write in now I could also drag my audio folder if I wanted to in here, or I can make my own bins. The bins that you make inside of Premiere Pro are completely independent of what your file organization on your computer is. So I can make one called O2 Audio, Audio. And if I click it, and hold it there, and then I make a new bin that's a sub bin, right? And that goes right inside of it. So I can call one H4N. That is the name of the recorder that I recorded everything on. And then SFX for sound effects, right? And I'll make another one for music, music. And then I can go ahead and drag in my voiceovers. So I'll go to audio, H4N, I'll select all of these clips H4N and drag them into the H4N bin. So now they are in here. And I'll save the SFX and music folders for later. I won't put anything in there quite yet. Now I'm going to need a bin for just sequences. So these are my timelines. I like to have several timelines that I can work off of and refer back to so that every time I make a new version of the video, I just make a new timeline instead of editing the same timeline over and over and over again. It's kind of like, think about it like if you've ever used Photoshop and you have baked something in as a JPEG, you can't really go back into that JPEG and fix things, right? So it's good to have multiple versions so that you can go back and adjust. So I'll go into new bin and I'll say 03 sequences. And the reason that I put numbers in front is the words footage, audio, and sequences are, if I put them in alphabetical order like this, right, they're going to be, it's going to say audio first, right? Then footage, then sequences. But if I put numbers in front of them, I can keep them in whatever order I want. So that's why I do that. So sequences is empty for now. And I'll do another one, 04 for graphics. And that is everything that I need for now to be able to complete this project. So I have footage, audio, sequences, and graphics. Now, each of these windows can actually be expanded full screen 
If you select it, that draws a blue border around the edges. You can see there's that blue border. And then you press the tilde key on your keyboard, which is the squiggly line at the top left. That makes this panel bigger. So you can press it and it goes big. You can always also rearrange the panels anywhere you want based on how you want them to look, where you want things to be. You can arrange anything anywhere. Sometimes though, if you, who, you know, arrange things too much, you can get lost, right? And it can start looking really messy and you don't know where anything is. So if you want to go back to the way it was before, that's fine. All you have to do is again, click on that little menu next to editing and go to reset to save layout. So don't freak out if something isn't right. You can always go back to the way it was. So we'll go here and we'll open this up using the tilde key so that we can see it more, right? We can see cam A, cam B, cam C. Now there's lots of different ways that you can view your clips. You can view them in a list like this. This is called list view. You can view them as thumbnails. So if you go down here, these are all the different views you can have. You can see them as thumbnails. So now if I click into each one, the thumbnails populate and I can use this slider down here to make the thumbnails bigger if I want or smaller. If I want to preview what's inside of the clip, I can just hover my mouse over it to preview what is in that clip. Or I can use this time indicator and drag it. So this is a good way to preview clips. Also, if you noticed, there is a third way to look at your clips, which is the freeform view. It's actually a pretty new feature in Premiere. And this kind of lets you organize your clips as if they were sticky notes all over a tabletop. So you can organize them in different ways like that. So if I go to the freeform view, now they kind of start looking like they're a thumbnail view, but let's say I know that these files are tuna salad files, right? And I know that these files right here are egg cooker files. So if I wanted to put all the tuna salad files together, I could do something like that. And then the egg cooker files can be over here. And then say there were a couple that um, maybe were doubles. I could put them like this and I can make this one bigger if I wanted to by going to clip size and I can make it extra large. Let's say that that's the lead one, right? And everything else follows it. So really think about the freeform view as you can organize this any way you want. Um, this is really helpful for music videos, for documentaries, for everything that's sort of like non-linear and it's a nice way to organize. I really like it. But for now, we are going to stick to our basic list view and icon view. So we don't have to worry about this, uh, this freeform view, even though it's really cool. So let's go back to list view. And right here, we are inside a bin. You can see because the tab that we're in says bin, bin, cam C, that's where we're at. All of these tabs across the top help us see where we are at. So right now we're in cam C. If we want to go to the footage bin, that's the footage bin. If we want to go to the main project, that's the main project. So don't get lost because these tabs right here, they're hiding things, right? So let's go to the footage bin. And instead of being in thumbnail view, let's go to list view. And now we can pull up cam A, cam B, and cam C. And we can take a look a little bit more at what these files are, some more information about them, and uh, maybe color code them a little bit to help us out. The first thing that I like to look at is what is the size of the file, the dimensions of the file. Is this in 4K? Is this in HD? HD is literally pixels, right? Pixel dimensions literally mean how many dots of color are in the image. How many dots of color comprise the image across the top of the screen and the side of the screen. There is 
1920 pixels across the top and 1080 pixels across the side, that is HD. 4K is literally four times bigger than HD. So it's 3840 by 2160. And a bunch of these clips I shot in 4K and a bunch of these clips I shot in HD. So when you shoot things with different sizes, you kind of have to decide, okay, what size is my sequence going to be? If I make an HD sequence, I can always scale down my 4K clips to fit that HD sequence and I won't lose any pixels, right? But if I make a 4K sequence, my 4K clips are going to be fine, but my 1080 clips are going to be super small and I'll have to increase their size and they'll lose pixels. So think about it. That information can be found in the video info column. And you can see the video info column sort of hides when you're in this view. If I press tilde again on my keyboard uh, and I go back to the way that it was before, you can see that the only things they show you are frame rate, media start, and media end. But we can fix that. So we can rearrange these columns so that the information that we care about most is seen first. So we'll go back, press that tilde button on the keyboard again to make that full screen. We'll take that video info column and we'll literally drag it to the front. So it's the first thing we see is the size of the clip. And then the frame rate is another really good thing to see right away. The third thing that I like seeing right away is the media duration, and that will become super important later. So I actually think it's probably the second most important thing. So that's what I want to see. I want to see video info, I want to see media duration, and I want to see frame rate as the first three columns so that when it's really small here in the corner, I can still see it. I can make it a little bit. There we go. So I can see everything right there. Now, I also think it's really important if you are shooting with multiple cameras to make sure that each camera is color coded. This will come in real handy if you're trying to later put a bunch of effects on just one camera's clips and not a different camera's clips and they're all mixed together in your timeline. You can just say, hey, I wanna select all of the orange clips or all of the blue clips and apply a certain effect only to those clips. So here in camera A, we are going to leave all of these clips this blue color. And if we right click on the actual blue color and we go to label, we can see that it's called iris. Now for cam B, for our side camera, I'm going to select the first clip, hold down shift and then select to the last clip. And that selects all the clips in the middle. I'm going to right click go to label and let's make these mango. So you can see they've all changed to mango. And then camera C, I'm gonna do the same thing. Select the first one, hold down shift, select the last one, right click, go to label and let's make them magenta. So now when we drag these clips into our timeline, into our sequence, we will have them already colored for us. Let's start making our first video. This is what I call a hands and pans video, which is a cooking video from the top. And this is what it'll look like when it's finished. I was starving, now I'm eating till my belly full. From up north, we get cold, you need a heavy coat. My bros for life, can't break this link. Family on my side, baby, stay around me. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. I'm all in my ass, way, I'm a wreck. I've been moving like a hot mess. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. The 
first thing we have to figure out is what does that canvas look like? What does our sequence look like? How many frames per second? What is the size? Um, what are the settings? And one really easy way to do this is to just make it exactly the same as the clip that you're using. In this case, if we go to our footage folder here and we go to camera C and we go to the first tuna salad uh, clip here, let's actually make this as thumbnails. We'll organize them by name and we'll go to the very first tuna salad clip, which is this one, where the ingredients are coming out. All you have to do is take the actual clip and drag it into this button called new item. And that will create a sequence with that clip inside the sequence. And the sequence will be the same dimensions, the same settings as the clip. So we can do that right now. We can just take this clip and drag it into the new item, the page turn. And now here we see a timeline has been created for us. The name of the timeline is the same as the name of that first clip. And we have the clip on our timeline. Uh, that is one way to do it. And you can actually go up here to sequence. And if you select sequence settings, you'll see that it has given us the following settings. The time base is 23.976 frames per second. That is the standard time base for um, most videos that cameras are going to be recording. There's other time bases as well. This just means your frames per second. So this just means your frame rate. Uh, you also have your frame size. So this is standard, right? 1920 by 1080 and square pixels. So each pixel is a square. And then everything else you don't really have to worry about. And that's how you know your sequence settings, right? So you can just have the sequence here. What it does is it adds the sequence to the bin that has the footage in it. So if I go back out to the list view, you can see here, all of these are clips, but it has added this additional item, which is the sequence. And it has the little sequence, um, icon next to it. That's how you know that this is a clip that has both audio and video, and this is a sequence. So if you wanted to rename the sequence, you can just click on it, rename it. So we'll call this tuna salad clips. And if you wanted to put it in our sequences bin, we'll just go out uh, over here. One folder, a couple of folder organizations up. So now we can just take it and drag it into our sequences bin. So now that tuna salad clips is in our sequences bin. Another way that we can create a sequence is to create it from scratch without using a clip to create it. So we'll just select our sequences bin. That way we know automatically the new sequence is going into the sequences bin. And with the sequence has been selected, we'll just go and click on new item, the page turn icon. Here are a bunch of new items that you can create, including at the top sequence. So you click on that and you can go into the basic one is the very, very first one right here. It's under Ari, which is a type of uh, camera manufacturer, 1080p and then 23.976. And if we go over here to the settings tab, you'll be able to see the same settings, 23976, 1920 by 1080, square pixels, et voila. And here you can name the sequence. So we're gonna call it all tuna clips. And in fact, let's put a zero one in front of it. All tuna clips string out. And that's it. I'm going to press OK. And now we have a sequence with no clips in it yet. So if we wanted to drag those tuna salad clips in there, uh, all we would do is select them. So right now they're not in order. If we wanted to put them in alphabetical order, we'll just click on this word name and that puts them in alphabetical order. 
So now you can see they're, they're in order here. One, two, three, four, right? So we'll select the first one, hold down shift, select the last one that selects all of them. And then we will just drag them all into our timeline. So now they're all in there. Looks like number three is uh, very, very short. Why is that? I think it was just short to begin with, so we don't need it. We can ripple delete it and get rid of it. So we can do that either by pressing delete and then taking this one, moving it over, or instead of doing that, I'm gonna undo that by going to Command Z. So undoing that, we can take it and ripple delete it by clicking Command D and that ripple deletes it and gets rid of it. We can also see previews of everything that is in our project by just raising this up. And that way we can see the thumbnails of what we are looking at. Now that we have our clips in our timeline, there are three clips. It is looking like it's 20 minutes long. Um, we don't need all 20 minutes of clips, right? There's a lot of stuff in here where I am taking my hands out, where things need to be sped up. We don't need all of that. So we are gonna cut out everything that's unnecessary and only leave the necessary things. Speaking of unnecessary things, these clips come with audio, right? The audio was recorded on the camera. And you can see that when I select each clip, it also selects the audio. So this is the video portion of it, and this is the audio portion of it. Now, I don't need any of the audio in this case. So how do I delete just the audio? Well, right now the clips are what is called linked. And you can tell that they're linked because the little V here for video is in these hard brackets. So we are going to unlink the audio from the video so that we can delete the audio. So we'll select all the clips. We can either draw a marquee box around them or press command A to select all of them. Right click and go to unlink. And watch what happens when we unlink them. Ta-da, now we're able to select all the audio and video independently and that little V in brackets at the end of the file name is gone. So now we can just select all these audio clips and delete them. We don't need them. This video does not require that audio. So now we can scrub through and get rid of things that we don't want or don't need in this video. And the first thing that I see here is the way that this was recorded was ingredients first, right? All the ingredients are laid out and then I took them off one by one. But eventually that needs to be reversed, right? First, let's cut it up the way that it is. So first we need this shot and we can ignore, we can ignore everything here for right now because that shows each clip, right? As we pull up each clip, double clicking on it, that gives us a little preview of what that clip is. This gives us a preview of what we are seeing on our timeline, right? So we're working with our timeline exclusively right now, so we don't have to worry about what's over here. So let's go forward and I do this thing where, and you can zoom in on your timeline over here by dragging these two points closer to each other or farther from each other. So I'll zoom in a little bit and I do this thing where my hands go like that, and that's kind of where I wanna start. So I need to cut out this section. I can either go to the razor tool right here, cut right there, then go back to the selection tool, which is over here, select that, delete it, move this forward. That is one way to cut out the beginning of a clip. I'm gonna undo and show you all the ways. Uh, another way to do this is instead of going over and physically choosing the razor tool, you can see that the shortcut here is C. So if you press C, that makes it a razor tool. So you can cut that. Then you can click V to go back to your selection tool, select it, delete it, and then move that forward. 
That is another way to do it. Let's undo, undo, undo. Another way to do it is to basically slice the clip at your playhead or at your current time indicator, this blue line which shows you where you are in the clip, right? So if I wanted to cut it right there, that shortcut is Command K. So I can go Command K or Control K on a keyboard and I can place that cut there and I can delete it and move it forward, right? Or I can ripple delete it, right? So if I undo that and do Command D, that ripple deletes it, I'll undo again or the easiest way to do it and this is maybe a little bit of a hack that a lot of people don't know about but learning about it from the very beginning is so helpful is to press q on your keyboard the q button and what the q button does is it places a cut at the current time indicator at the playhead. So it basically does command K for you. So it places the cut and it deletes everything before the cut and after the previous cut. In this case, this is the previous cut and this is the cut that we are making, right? So if I press just the Q button, my favorite button, there we go. And now it starts there. And now I wanna place a cut there. So what do I do? Command K, that places a cut. And then let's go to our next point. Oh, I kinda of like that version better. So I'll do Q again. So now I have this. And let's just, before I put my hands in it again, let's press Command K. So now I have these two clips. I have the first one with this version of it, and I have the second one. I think I like the longer one, so I'm gonna get rid of this one by going to Command D and getting rid of it and ripple deleting. You can also select it, right click, go ripple delete from the menu, or if you forget a shortcut, you can go to edit keyboard shortcuts and here you can search for keyboard shortcuts and it will tell you exactly what that keyboard shortcut is. So if you type in ripple delete, it'll show you that it is control D. Very, very handy. So next I'm going to wait until let's see okay that's kind of clean right there so basically i want a frame or a section of the video that doesn't have the yogurt in it so i want to place a cut here and delete all of this from the previous cut to this cut so i'll go ahead and press q again and now i have deleted it oh let's press q again Let's give myself a little bit more. There we go, I was getting rid of the condensation. So before my hand goes back in, I'll press Command K, inserting a cut there. And I think I'm just gonna wait for it to dry a little bit. There we go. Again, to insert a cut and get rid of everything before it, I will press Q. Before my hand reaches in again, I'll press Command K. Q, Command K, so now that I have chopped all of those up, it looks like they are disappearing instead of appearing on my timeline. So what I want to do is rearrange the clips so that the first clip is actually at the end and the last clip is at the beginning. So the complete opposite of what's happening here because I want it to look like the ingredients are coming onto the table instead of the other way around. So I'll go to this clip where we don't see anything on the table and I wanna move it to the front, right? But if I just move it to the front, it overrides on top of the clip that's already there. You see that? So this clip, 
is around, let's see, it's around one second long. And if I put this clip here, it overrides on top of it. So in order to ripple it, move it to the front while all the other clips scooch over, what I have to do is as I'm moving it, I hold down Alt and Command at the same time and that scooches all the clips. So I'm going to do that for every clip, just changing the order of it until it looks like the ingredients are just popping on in the right order. So now there's the eggs. and Everything is popping on one thing at a time. And then ta-da, those are the ingredients. It's okay if this isn't currently at uh, the right length. What I'm trying to do is build a string out, which is make all of the usable footage available for me so that later I can set it to music and add other clips on top of it. This is what's called an assembly. And here I have all of my clips assembled. My A roll is assembled, which means that everything is in the order that I want it to be. And all of the usable footage is here. So if I scrub through it really fast, you can see all of the ingredients appear and then the tools appear. And then you have the actual tutorial uh, all in order. The whole thing makes sense. Now I want to keep this for later. I don't want to chop up this particular sequence because um, I want to duplicate it and then chop up the duplicate just in case, right? Just in case I chop it up and get rid of something that then I want to bring back. I want to keep it. So I'm going to go to the name of the sequence, which is called tuna salad one assembly, right click and say reveal sequence in project and it shows me exactly where in my project that sequence is. Right here it says tuna salad one assembly. So if I want to duplicate it and then edit the duplicate, I'll right click and I'll go to duplicate here at the top. And there it is, it has duplicated it right here, assembly copy one. So I can rename that, say assembly, cut and then open up assembly cut by double clicking on it. And you can see now I've opened up assembly cut, but assembly is still here to refer to it. They look exactly identical at this moment. Now that we have our assembly cut with our camera C, in this case, this is our main overhead camera. It's time to bring some other clips in like the final finished product of the tuna salad and a few clips in between just to shake it up and change cameras. So here in cam B, we can see we have a few clips of the finished tuna salad. There it is on a table. There it is a little bit closer on a plate. And there's a close up of it. Now we're going to take this close up and place it at the very beginning of our sequence, but we don't want to use this entire clip. Uh, like before, when we were dragging the clips in, you see how that is way too long. It is unnecessarily long for our purposes. So something that you can do is you can actually trim a clip before you put it in. So instead of putting full clips in like we did before and then trimming them in the timeline, you can actually select just a portion of a clip and then bring that into your timeline. So let's do that. We'll go here to the source monitor and the way that we brought the clip up in the source monitor is just we double clicked on it and now it's in the source monitor. We'll use this playhead or this time indicator to go to the beginning of the section that we want to bring in. So let's find it. I like it there. So I want to start it here. So I will press I on my keyboard, I. That is I. And you can see by pressing the I button, 
it creates an endpoint and everything after the endpoint is colored in this light gray color. I'll take this indicator to where I want to end it and I will press O, that is the out point, I and O. And now it has selected, now I can place this section of the clip into my timeline a couple of different ways. The most basic way is to drag it directly from the bin like this, bam. So now you can see that orange clip is in my timeline. It is on a layer on top of all of my other clips and it has the uh, audio attached to it. And if I wanted to get rid of the audio, I could either right click and go to unlink or I could hold down Alt and then just select the audio and delete it. That's one way. Another way to do it, if I wanted to put it in the front and have the clip override the clip that's in the front is I could press the period button and that brings anything that is selected from the source monitor into your timeline. But as you can see, it has overridden the clip that's underneath it. What if you want to put it in where the in time indicator is, but also shift all the clips behind it? Well, instead of doing that, you can press the comma button on your keyboard and that will insert the clip instead of overriding and that will actually shift the clip back. You can then hold down alt and get rid of the audio if you wanted to. Uh, another way to do this is to drag just the video into the timeline. Over here underneath you have the drag video only or drag audio only and if you hover over them the hand uh, logo appears. So you can hold this and drag it by dragging it directly on top of the clip that overrides it. If you want it to ripple instead of overriding, as you drag it, hold down alt and command at the same time, and that will ripple everything. Either way you want to do it is fine. The whole point is that now that clip is the first clip and it shows us our final product. But you can see a little bit of an issue here, right? This clip, you can see the whole thing in it, right? And this clip is super zoomed in. Why is that? Well, that is because this tuna salad clip is actually in 4K. You can see it here. The dimensions are 3840 by 2160 instead of being HD 1920 by 1080 like our sequences. So how do you make it smaller? Well, let me actually physically show you how big it is. Here in the size controls, this is kind of controlling the way that you see your canvas. You can zoom out. So you, let's go to 25, let's go to 10% actually, and then select this clip. Let's go to effect controls over here and just select the motion controls. This shows the bounding box around the clip. There you can see it, it's this blue line. And it physically shows you the size of the clip relative to the size of your sequence. And you can very clearly see that the clip size is way bigger than the sequence size. That is from this orange clip right here. If we selected the pink clip that's right after it, and then selected the motion controls. <laughs> there you see that the clip is the exact same size as the sequence, whereas here it is way too big. So what can you do? Well, you would have to resize it. You would have to shrink it. You can do so by either, you know, selecting the word motion here and then physically making it smaller. You can see as I do this, this number right here for scale, it changes. So check what happens when I do that, when I increase it or decrease it. You see how this number changes? You generally don't want it to go above 100%, right? But it's cool if it's smaller than 100%. And you know that 4K is exactly four times the size of HD. So the scale for that exact number is going to be 50. Press 50 
and type that in and it's going to rescale for you. Another way to do this without going into the scale controls and doing all that jazz is right clicking and going to set to frame size and that will do it automatically. And of course, if you want the shortcut for it, you can find that shortcut under edit keyboard shortcuts. And if you type in set to frame size, you'll be able to see what that shortcut is. For me, I actually have two shortcuts, control shift F and control alt F, either of those will work. So if I did that instead, let's take it back to being four, full screen 4k uh, control shift F and that would set it to the right frame size and you can see that it has uh, it has adjusted here to the 50% so now you can see the whole clip fully I can also insert other clips into this sequence for example I don't really like uh, the yogurt being put on here from the top. I would rather have the yogurt kind of coming from the front instead. So I'll go to camera A and I will find that clip of the yogurt being put in. I'll find that section right there. So, and I'll do the same thing. I'll set in and out points, right? So I'll go I for in, go to maybe there i'll set o for out i'll place my playhead where i want that clip to be in this case i want the clip to kind of maybe be let's see right here so i'll put my playhead there i can either kind of guesstimate where the playhead is or i can just press the up and down buttons on my keyboard and that will just pop the playhead to the next edit point so I'll go exactly there and then I will use that comma that that insert shortcut to insert this section of this clip right there. So I'll go comma and there it is. Then I can go and continue choosing sections of this clip to continue building out this putting in yogurt section because it's quite a bit of yogurt. I can go frame by frame by going to the left and right keys to find the exact part of the clip that I want to start on right there. I'll go I, O, and then comma, and I'll build that out. And I'll continue building out the sequence until all of those clips from all of the other cameras are in. So now that I've built the sequence, you can see that it's starting to look pretty good. It cuts back and forth between the two cameras and I've cut out a lot of the fat. So that means only the parts where there's action is uh, what's being shown on screen. But then we get to these sections that is just mixing, right? And they're sort of slow. So I want to speed them up. I want to change the speed of these clips. How do I do that? It's actually really simple. There's a bunch of ways to do it. One simple way is to right click and go to speed duration. And then you can type in either the new speed that you want or the new duration that you want. So right now this is 12 seconds. Let's say that I want two seconds. That's my new duration. And it tells me if you want it two seconds, it'll be sped up by 645%. And I could say, yes, please, that sounds good. Okay, and there we go. And now that clip has been sped up a lot faster, right? But say I want it to be even faster and I don't wanna do the whole thing where I right click and go to speed duration. I could just change the tool that usually when I hover over and I make the clip shorter and I make the clip longer, this actually literally makes the clip shorter. You know, this cuts off the clip. But if I wanted, I could make that be a rate stretch tool, literally stretching it out like rubber. So if I choose the R uh, button on my keyboard, R, that turns into a rate stretch tool. You can see without R, 
what happens is on the edge, you have this indicator. But when you choose R, it now changes to this indicator. And that is now the rate stretch indicator. And you can see here, it says right now it says that this is playing back at 645 percent but if i change it i can make it even faster and now it's playing back at 1372.4 percent and i have just changed the speed of it or the rate of it uh, without going into that tool. Now, uh, let's change the speed of everything. So let's rate stretch this, make that faster. Let's rate stretch this, make that a lot faster. Uh, let's rate stretch this, make that a lot faster. Now they're all really, really fast. And I have these gaps here. One, two, three, four. I have these gaps in my timeline where there's nothing, right? It's just black. Um, what can I do? Well, one thing I could do is draw a dialog box around and then just scooch these over. And as long as you have snapping enabled, which is this, um, ma this magnet icon right here, it will just snap to the next edit point, just like magnetically, right? Uh, if you don't have the magnet enabled, it won't snap. So it'll kind of keep searching for that spot. You can also uh, just place your mouse right in between and using the A button, that is the, the A button on your keyboard, you can select everything after your mouse. So if you wanted to select, let's say, if you wanted to select this and this and this at the same time, and you didn't want to drag a box around it like we used to do, like this, you can just place your mouse over here, select A, and that selects everything after your mouse. And then you can go ahead and, you know, bring it over. Um, but you want to get rid of the gaps, right? So just click in that gap, right click and say ripple delete. And that gets rid of the gap there. Really, really simple. You can do that for every single gap, or you can get rid of all of the gaps at the same time. So I will undo all that. If I want to get rid of all of the gaps, I have a shortcut for that. It is shift command G and that gets rid of all of the gaps. That is a shortcut that I made. And again, if you would like to see the shortcuts, you can go to keyboard shortcuts, type in gap and close gap. That's what you want. And you can create your own shortcut. So my shortcut closes all the gaps. So now, there are no gaps, so it looks like this. All that mixing footage is now stretched, rate stretched forward. Now, sometimes, depending on how fast your computer is, um, it might not play back smoothly for you. And you can tell by this line up top. If the line is yellow, that's kind of a danger zone. If a line is red, that means, uh-oh, it's really going to be hard to play back. So you may want to render whatever section you're having trouble playing back. The way that you do that is you select that section of your timeline. So remember when we were over here selecting sections of a clip to bring into our sequence? Well, you can select sections of a sequence to render or export. It's really simple. So just place your playhead at the beginning of the section that you want to render so that it plays back smoothly for you by going up and down on the arrow keys and bringing that playhead exactly to where you want to start and click I. It's the same shortcut. Go to the end. So let's see, I want it to end here and press O. So it's basically telling the program that this is the section that I would like to render. And I go over here to sequence and then render in to out, right? Render I to O. And if I select that, it'll take a second to render, right? There's the render box. But you can see how now this section is turning green and green is good. It means it's going to play back smoothly for me now. And there it is, really, really smooth playback.
Now, if I want to get rid of these in and out points, I can always right click and select clear in and out and it will get rid of the in and out points. In and out points are also really, really helpful if you want to replay a section of your video again and again and again. So say that I want to replay this section again and again and again, these three um, pink clips. So I'll go ahead and I'll drag my out point to the end of the three pink clips. So this is the section that I wanna keep replaying. And I will select the loop playback tool, which is just right here. And if it doesn't appear in your version of Premiere Pro, that just means that it hasn't been enabled. So go to the button editor over here, this plus, click that, and the loop playback tool should be right here. And you can just drag it into your buttons. It doesn't usually sit there by default. You do have to drag it in press OK. So now that loop playback is enabled, if I press play using this button or just my space bar, press play, it just loops over and over and over again. Cool, right? Now that we have our edits in order, we have sped some clips up, we have inserted other clips. Uh, one thing that we do need to do is take a look at, okay, how long do we want this edit to be? And for me, it helps to know the destination and to also edit to music. In this case, I want this edit to be under a minute long because maybe it's for Instagram or something like that. You can see here on the right, um, an indication of how long your entire edit is. And here is where your playhead currently is in your edit. So as I move my playhead about, you can see this number change and this number doesn't. If I set an out point somewhere on my project, like say I set an out point right here at where my indicator is by pressing the O button on my keyboard, you can see that that number on the right has changed to whatever the out point says it is. And it is currently at the same exact time as my time indicator, so they are both the same. Um, but I'll clear that out point by going to clear in and out. I am ready to choose a music track and put it in. Now, uh, just like there is this video track here, there are plenty of tracks for audio and you can put in whatever audio you'd like, but Premiere Pro does have uh, some partnerships with audio libraries that you can license music from. So if you wanted to do that, you can just pull up the essential sound panel. See, there's all these panels that are hiding that aren't open at first because you can always pull them up later if you need them. There's also all of these workspaces up top that you can pop into, as well as you can create your own workspaces. I have some custom workspaces for custom monitor configurations that I have. But for now, we'll be doing everything in the editing workspace and just pulling up windows instead. So we'll go into Essential Sound and by default, it pops up over here on the right. And inside of Essential Sound, um, there are a couple of different tabs and both of them do different things. So we have the Edit tab, which you can edit whatever the type of audio is. You can assign it as dialogue or as music, sound effects or ambiance. And we'll do that a little bit later, but for now we're gonna go to the Browse tab. And here is where you can find different songs for your projects. So you can filter it by mood or by genre, et cetera, et cetera. So I will go with, let's do, happy and the genre let's do pop and yeah we'll do a a tempo that's like fairly fast 
and eventually we'll find our song. For this one, however, I already know the song that I want, so I'm just gonna type that in. I'm gonna type in the song Hot Mess, and it pulls up here. There is both an instrumental version and a non-instrumental version in my case because there's no other sound in this video, so I can just go with the non-instrumental version. And there's a way to preview the track or audition the track if you will, um, by playing it here by pressing the play button. And if you have timeline sync selected, you can put your playhead, which is your line here at the beginning of your video. And then while timeline sync is selected, you can actually listen to the song while your video plays before the song is even placed in your timeline, if that makes sense. So let's play it. Starving, now I'm mean to my belly full. From up north, we get cold, you need a heavy coat. Scared to end up on a shirt before it's in the fold. Devil on my back, target on me, deadly toe. So that sounds pretty good to me. What I'm going to do is just drag this clip directly into my timeline. And there it is right there. Now a little bit of time has passed and I have cut up this music track and put some transitions in it so that it's shorter and so that it's under a minute long. Um, this is a little bit more of an advanced technique that we're not gonna cover today in this tutorial, but just so you know, the track is now less than a minute long. And I still have all of these clips that don't exactly fit the timing of the track or the beat of the track. So how do I make them fit the beat of the track? Well, one way that you could do it is by placing markers on your timeline. Markers are like little visual ticks here at the top, which are snappable, which means that your clips can just magnetically snap to those markers and they help you kind of figure out what you want to do with your timeline. You can change their colors, you can change their duration. But for me, I also like to actually point out my beat with them. So as I listen to the song, I'm gonna place my playhead here to the very beginning of the timeline. And I'm gonna to listen to the song, keep my finger on the M key, which is for marker. And you can see as the beats of the song come in, I'm going to start placing the markers and you'll see them appear right here. I'm going to press play by hitting my space bar. I was starving, now I'm mean to my belly full. From up north, we get cold, you need a heavy coat. My bros for life, can't break this link. Family on my side, baby stay around me. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. I'm all in my ass, way, I'm a wreck. I've been moving like a hot mess. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. I'm all in my ass, way, I'm a wreck. I've been moving like a hot mess. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. Make sense? So now I have all of these markers placed and they are to the beat. So if I want the ingredients, for example, to show up on the beat, all I have to do is visually look at the markers and adjust. So I'll start there. If I don't want to touch the audio tracks accidentally, you know, by selecting them, I can press the lock button and lock that track. So if I press the lock button now, I can't select anything. So it makes it really easy for me to be able to place clips on other tracks without affecting that track. So I'll go ahead and every time I drag one of the ends of the clip to shorten it, it just snaps to the next marker, making it super, super easy to, without even looking, really just edit the video by snapping it to the markers. And of course, this is just the ingredients list, so it's pretty easy to cut because it's a static shot every time. 
and I think, and I, I want to get rid of this gap, so I'm just going to right click, ripple delete. Let's see what that looks like. Cool, right? Last few steps of this video, let's add some graphics, adjust a few clips, and we'll be good to go. The first thing I want to do is adjust some of these clips so that they are a little bit better framed. Like this clip, for example, there's a lot of extra space here, and there's some dirt on the table here, which I want to frame out. So I want to punch in a little bit closer on this clip, somewhere around here. The good thing is that I did record this in 4K, right? So you can see here the scale is currently at 50%. So if I just move that scale up, and then I can also take the numbers for the position. Right now it's at 960 and 540, but I can move this up slightly. Therefore, the center uh, of my subject is now in the center. And now I have it exactly where I need it to be. And it's still at 78%. So it's still. Um, the actual clip is still larger than my sequence size, which means that I haven't actually lost any pixels at all. So those are the edges of the clip there. Now, if I want to um, add these motion controls, so the, the motion controls that I've adjusted for position and scale to the other clips in my timeline, like this one and this one and this one, what I have to do is just select the motion controls of that main clip by putting my playhead over the clip. Oh, by the way, every time I'm clicking, do you hear that the music is going? That's a little annoying, right? So let me mute it by pressing the M button for the music. So I'll just mute it. And that way I can't hear it and I can work in peace. So I'll go onto the clip that I've changed the size of and the position, and I'll select the word motion up here, and I'll go Command C for copy. Then I'll select all these clips, and I'll go Command V for paste, and now I have pasted those motion controls onto the other clips. So now if you check, you can see that their position and scale is also changed. Um, what's great is that we did add those co that color coding to the clip. So I can just go on to the next one, which I know is this one because it's color coded with the same blue. And here I can see that maybe I need to punch in a little bit more. So if I paste it, Command V over here, I pasted it, but it's kind of slanted. The table's kind of slanted, right? So I can use the rotation controls to level that table out. And now I'll do that again. I'll select the motion control, command C for copy, and I will paste it across to these and also across to this one. For this one, it's a little off center now because my subject is actually this bowl and not this plate. So I can go ahead and over here in the X position control, I can move it over. There we go. Now you can also see that I've started adding some graphics here, like uh, the get rid of yolks and the uh, cut eggs in half, peel them and all that. So let's take a look at how to add these graphics. You can see that they are added to the second layer or the second track, the second video track here on V2. And the graphics themselves are pretty much just the text, right? And everything else, there's nothing there. So we see everything that's stacked on top first and then everything that's stacked below it is hidden underneath right so if this pink clip was for example on v3 then it would be hiding 
the red clip, which is the text, right? So we want the text to show up on top of the pink clip. So we put the pink clip underneath it. Now, how did we get this text? Well, it's very simple. You just go up to window and you pull up essential graphics. That is what Premiere calls its graphics um, window. So just click on essential graphics and that pulls up essential graphics over here. Just like for the audio, we had the edit tab and the browse tab. So in the browse tab, you can find lots of fun graphics from Adobe stock. So if you go onto the Adobe stock tab over here, you can see, you can filter them by free or by premium. So if we filter them by free, you can see all the free um, graphics available here. And I'm going to just type in title and see what happens. So as I click on each one, it gives me a little preview of what that would look like for different titles. I like this one that says your title. So what I'm going to do is drag it in to the very beginning of my sequence, right on top of this intro clip. I want to put in a title that says what this recipe is, right? So I'll just drag it directly in. And by default, it looks like this. Right? So it's a little bit long for me. So I'm going to just cut it by using that razor tool, going to C, cutting it there, going to V, changing my cursor back to a selection tool, and then deleting. So that, there it is. That's what it starts on. Now I can go ahead and change what it says. So what I want it to say, I'll just double click on it, is low calorie tuna eggs. And now the edit tab, I can go ahead and adjust all these controls to customize it for me. So let's just say, for example, that my brand colors for my YouTube channel were purple, right? So these bars that come up right here, let's change them from red to purple. So the bar, let's go to the fill color and make it, yeah, this pinky color, top beam, let's change that to a purple. And then I guess we'll leave it at that. And then the low calorie tuna eggs, right now it's just white text with nothing behind it. So I can add, if I want, I could add a background and I'll expand it a little bit. There we go. And I'll make it a little bit more opaque so you can read the letters a little bit better. So this is what it looks like. Great. So now I want to put something that says ingredients over here. So what I'm going to do is just duplicate this one and bring it over. So I'm going to select this red graphic here. And while holding down Alt, I'm going to drag it over and that's going to duplicate it and drag it. So now it says low calorie tuna eggs, but what it what I want it to actually say is ingredients. So I'm going to change this to ingredients. Maybe get rid of the background color because I don't need it anymore. One issue is that by the time you see the word ingredients, which is a little high, so maybe I'll move it down over here in the transform controls. By the time you see the word ingredients, um, we're already on to the next clip, right? So we want the word ingredients to be written on the screen before the next clip starts, that before the first ingredient starts, right? So something that I can do is just move this graphic over to V3 and overlay it on top of the first graphic slightly. How about like that? Let's see what that looks like. 
Um, let's make it a little shorter here. Scooch it over so that the writing isn't written on top of each other. That looks great. So let's play it with the music. Perfect. So now I can start writing the ingredients. For this one, let's see what we have for text. Maybe I want to change the font of this to my brand font, right? I can go ahead and do that. So instead of the default that it comes with, Roboto, let's say that my brand font is Akagi Pro, and that is the one that I will choose. Same thing for this one. I'll go ahead and change the font to Akagi Pro. So now I have used the correct font, the brand font in both. Then for this one, I actually won't use a template to write out my ingredients. I'll just straight up write them out on the screen. So I'll go to my type tool, which is this T, and then I'll just type on the screen, right on the screen itself. And I'll write six hard boiled eggs, or maybe just six eggs. There we go. And I can select it, make it smaller. There we go. I don't need it to be anything fancy. And there we go, six eggs make sure that it's lined up to the beginning of that uh, clip. And then what I'll do is I'll use the razor tool. So I'll go C to change it to a razor tool and I'll just cut it right there. And now instead of six eggs, I'm going to double click and write one green onion Then move that over. There we go. Exp Extend that, do again the razor tool, cut. Then this one, I'll write uh, chives. Move that over. And actually I'll change this to six hard boiled eggs. And so on and so forth. Now that I have adjusted my clips and placed my graphics, this is what the video looks like. If you would like to download this video and see it for yourself and have the file, you can do it in the project assets. I provided this download for you. I'm going to change the display resolution from one fourth over here to full so that I can view it in full quality. And if any of it stalls, that means that that is a section that I might have to render in order to play it back smoothly. Starving now, I'm mean to my belly full. From up north, we get cold, you need a heavy coat. My bros for life, can't break this link. Family on my side, baby, stay around me. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. I'm all in my ass, where I'm a red. I've been moving like a hot mess. I don't want no combo, I want checks. I don't want the second, I want this. I'm all in my ass when I'm a wreck I've been moving like a hot mess I don't want no combo, I want checks I don't want the second, I want best I'm all in my ass when I'm a wreck I've been moving like a hot mess Now say that I want to export this video uh, it's very, very easy to do. You can either go to File, Export, Media, or you can just press Control M on your keyboard. That'll pull up the Export Settings dialog box. Um, Premiere Pro makes it really easy to export for different social medias. So if you select your format as H.264, you'll be able to see all of these pre-built um, settings for different social medias. So whether you want to export it to Facebook or Twitter or what have you, there's different options. 
I usually just choose mesh source high bitrate, and that's good enough for me. And then I can put that on whatever social media. Another thing about match source high bitrate is if your sequence isn't a standard size, say it's a square sequence or a vertical sequence, match source high bitrate will also adapt to your sequence size. And after I do that, um, I'll go to output name and I will give it a name and I'll put it in my exports folder. So I'll go to exports and I'll give it a name. Most times I do something like 2020, 0923 underscore, and then I'll do tuna salad underscore one, and then I'll click save. That updates the file name here, and then I will click export. Um, the reason that I do the date underscore a number is because if I am sending this to a client, for example, or if I'm doing different versions, maybe I upload it to YouTube to test it and then there's something wrong with one of the clips or the audio or who knows what, um, I'll go ahead and export another sequence, another duplicated sequence, but I will call it underscore two, for example, so that I don't forget what I've done. But I'm going to click cancel now because I already have this video exported. The next video, we are jumping up in complexity. We are doing three different cameras and an external audio source, and we are mixing all of that together. So here I am within Premiere Pro once again. I have my project here with my footage folder and my subfolders, or in Premiere Pro, this is what is called bins. And if I press the tilde key on my keyboard, which is at the top left of the keyboard, I can pull this up so I can see it. I have color coded all my camera A clips with blue, all my camera B clips with orange, all my camera C clips with magenta down here. So I've already made my simple tuna recipe video. Now it's time to make my egg cooker review where I talk to camera. And this also um, uses audio that I recorded on a separate recorder, which was the H4N. So here underneath audio, I have the H4N audio. Now I have these columns for frame rate, for media start, media end, and media duration. The thing that I really want to know is the media duration. That's going to be key here. So I'm going to move the media duration column all the way forward so that I can see it the first thing, because that's how I'm going to know which clips line up with which clips, which clip from camera A lines up with which clip from camera B with camera C and the audio is by what their duration is and what the duration of the clips near them are. It'll make sense. So let's take a look at this first clip, Egg Cooker A. Okay, I'll press tilde again to get back to the main screen here. And if I look through this clip, if I double click, it's pulled up in the source monitor. And if I look through this clip, it's an intro clip, right? It's a clip where I'm talking about what I'm about to do. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool that I want to test out and unbox for you. So you can see here that the media duration of this first clip is 7 minutes and 36 seconds. And the media duration of the first clip in Cam B is 7 minutes and 44 seconds. So that's pretty close. In Cam C, we have 7 minutes and 11 seconds. And then in the H4N, which is our audio, we have a three minute clip. Mm, doesn't look good. A six second clip, mm, not right, right? And then we have a seven minute, 21 second clip. That's the one that's going to match. So that's what we're going to select. So we're gonna go all the way up here. Again, press the TLA key to make this bigger. Usually I would have this on a separate monitor, but We'll select both of them by holding down command. So we'll select camera A's seven minute clip, camera B's seven minute clip, camera C's seven minute clip, and the audio, the seven minute clip from there. So all four of those are selected. We will right click 
And then we'll go to create multi-camera source sequence. And that will help us sync all the clips. This means you didn't have to start all the clips at the same time. This just means that as long as there is some audio that was recorded by each of the three cameras, Premiere will sync that audio with the real audio that was recorded on a separate recorder. And it knows to do that over here. So if you choose audio as your synchronize point, it will select that audio and it will sync everything by the waveform of the audio. The other thing is for your audio clip name, I usually just keep it whatever it says here. So it's going to go by whatever the clip name is that you first selected. And then it's going to say multicam. And then I will also select enumerate cameras. This is very important because that is going to give each camera a number one, two, and three. And that's going to become really important when you're switching between cameras later. So I'm going to click OK. It takes a second to process because it's going to read the waveforms of all four clips. And then after it's done, it creates a multi-camera source sequence and it puts it right here at the very bottom of your window. And you can go ahead and do that for every single one of your clips. Once you create your multi-camera source sequences, now you can put those sequences into your project. So if you go to sequences, create a new one, a new sequence, and we're going to call this one um, egg cooker review multicam sequences. That's where we'll put all of them. And we'll drag the multicam sequence that was created into here. Now you can see that it's all in one clip. It's not like it's, uh, you know, there's so you can see that it's all in one clip. It's not like there's camera A on one track, camera B on another track, and camera C on a third track, but they're hiding inside the multi-camera source sequence. So if you hold down Alt and you click just the audio portion of it, and then you double click, now you are inside the multi-camera source sequence. And you can see all three of those stacked on top of each other. Camera C, the magenta one, is on top. So that's the one you're going to see. It's also the one that was recorded in HD. So that's why it's smaller than all the other ones that you can see behind. And you can see that all three of the audio tracks from the three cameras were muted. And only this track which is the track from the recorder is being played. So how can you tell? Well, let's actually hide both of these top clips right here by pressing on the eye icons so that we can see the one underneath and see if the voice lines up. Let's play it. Found kind of weird on the packaging. It said that it can cook up to seven eggs but since most eggs come in packs of one. So you can see that it matches and that is the audio from the recorder. If I wanted to check what the audio from the actual camera sounded like, well, I know it's this blue audio here, right? So I'll mute the recorder audio and I'll unmute the blue audio and I can listen to it here. One thing that I found kind of weird on the packaging, it says it could cook up to seven eggs at a time, but just a general rule of thumb, I think it's super helpful to record your audio off camera. Right now, the whole time you've been listening to a separate recorder, if you wanna hear what it sounds like from the actual camera, this is what it sounds like. It's never as good um, because the recorder or the microphone is just so far away, so. Definitely try to record with a separate audio input if you can. So this is a multicam workflow, um, but we don't have time to get into that right now. I think what might help you is the synchronized workflow. So instead of doing this, 
we'll go back to the sequences bin. We'll go to new item down here, new item sequence. And uh, with those same settings, which are 23.976, frame size 1920 by 1080 square pixels, we are going to create a sequence that is for the egg cooker review. And we are going to put all the A roll clips, all the clips of me talking onto the timeline and then synchronize them. So we'll go sequence name, egg cooker review um, assembly and press OK. So now we have a sequence and we'll go through and here under cam A, I'll go ahead and I'll select all of the cam A clips and drag them in. So now they are all here. Now these clips are 4K clips, so they are a lot bigger than 1080. If I look at my viewer like this, I go to effect controls, select motion, you can see that the clip is really large. So I can fit it to the size of the sequence. So I'll select everything by pressing command A that selects everything. And then I'll go shift command F and that will fit it to the frame size. So now they're all properly framed and you can see they've been scaled to 50% over here. Now what I'm going to do is go to cam B. I'm going to select all of the cam B clips. There's a bunch at the end that are just B roll. So I'm not going to select those And the way that I'll know which ones they are is I can go ahead and change this to icon view. So I can tell that starting around here, those clips are just B-roll, right? So I don't need to put them into the A-roll assembly. So I'll just select the A-roll clips from camera B and I'll drag them on top here. And you can see that they've already started aligning here by the length. So I can already get a feel for what matches with what. And over here on cam C, I'll do the same thing. So I'll open it up. I'll look at the thumbnail view. And I know starting like here, it is the tuna salad video. So I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to select all of the egg cooker shots by going, selecting the first one, holding down shift, selecting the last one that selects all of them. Just to make sure that they're in alphabetical order, I'll go over here and I'll order them. I'll just make sure that they're ordered by name right? Not anything else, but by name. That way I know that they're in the right order. I'll select all of them and pull them up here. So now I have a bunch of clips. Um, they're not synced yet, but they're close. The last thing that I need to do is pull in my audio as well. So I'll go through inside of H4N and I'll pull in all of that audio over here. So that is all the audio. And I can almost immediately tell that I messed up somewhere where my mic died. My mic died on this clip over here and it died on the eh, on the last bit of this clip over here, actually more than halfway. So pretty much um, everything here and everything here is useless. So I can pretty much get rid of it. I'm not going to get rid of it right now, but I know I need to get rid of it. So now I can start to arrange these clips and to match them up the best I can. So I'll use my A tool and A is the selection tool that selects everything after the playhead. So I can start selecting things. I'll use my A tool to select everything here, move it over and I'll start just making stacks. So I know that this looks like it pretty much matches there. And I know that this long clip here, let's see, these clips at the end match, right? They have to, so let's say these clips match here. These clips definitely match with each other. So I'll start making these stacks. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be stacked on top of each other. 
after a little bit of work of creating these stacks, this is what I got. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stacks, and then some disparate clips that are just on the timeline and I'll take care of them later. But now that I've got this going, I can go ahead and synchronize them. I'll select all of these, right click and click synchronize. Use audio as my synchronize point and press OK. It takes a second, but this way it will synchronize without having to go into the multicam editing. Right click, go to synchronize and press OK. Select the whole stack, right click, synchronize, OK, and you do this for all of the stacks until they are all synced. So here are all of the stacks synced. And if I want to close all of the gaps, I just go to Command Shift G and I close the gaps. And now it's time for me to go in and start cutting. Uh, a couple of things, if you want to slice across the entire stack, insert a giant cut across the entire stack, what you do is first of all, I'm going to just hide the visibility of the top two layers. I know they're there, but for now, as I'm scrolling through and just making sure that everything works, I don't need them. So I'm going to hide them. And also I don't need to play all four of the audios, right? Because if I play all four of the audios, it sounds like this. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool. So I can just play the green audio and that will be enough for me. I can either mute the other three that I want to test out. Or instead of muting the other three, I can just solo this green track. And it'll be the same thing. And unbox for you. Now a little bit about track targeting. You can see here that the V1 track has this blue background highlight on it, but the other two do not. This means that operations that I apply across tracks are only going to affect the V1 track. For example, say I am looking at this waveform right here. I can already tell where the false starts are, right? It looks like I started talking here, then I made a mistake. Then I started talking here. I made a mistake again. And I really only started talking properly right here. So I can move my playhead right to where that starts, right there. And I know that that's where I want to actually start my video. But I want to place a cut along all three of the video tracks and all four of the audio tracks right here at my playhead. However, because my track targeting is only on V1, if I want to use that shortcut Command K, what's going to happen? It's only going to place a cut right here at the V1 track. So if I wanted to slice across all the tracks, two options. I can either enable all three tracks with the track targeting by making sure that the blue background is behind all three of them. That way, when I press Command K, it cuts all three tracks, or I would have to press Shift Command K. And Shift Command K ignores the track targeting, and it'll cut through any tracks all the time. But I like having Command K, so I'll stay there. And now I can get rid of everything in front of this cut because I know that it's useless. I'm not going to need it. Select the whole thing and press Command D to ripple delete. And this is where I start. Now I can scrub through my footage quickly by using the JKL keys to rewind pause and fast forward. If I press J twice, I'll rewind even faster. If I press L twice, I'll rewind even faster and so on and so forth with the number of times I press each key. I'm going to keep the top two tracks 
hidden right now because again, I don't need them. I'm only doing the cut for content at this point. And then later I'll go through the tracks and enable, disable them based on which track I actually want to show up at what time. So let's listen through. I'm going to change the preview resolution from full to a quarter so that I can scrub through a little bit faster. And I'm going to be pressing the space bar to play and pause. So this is the everyday egg cooker from Dash. I found it at Target and as someone who cooks a lot of eggs every single day, I thought that this may be able to help me um, with some of that. So here is a great place to place a cut. So if I go Command K, what happens is that only the top row gets cut. Why? Because it was selected. So no matter what the track targeting shows, if you have a clip selected on your timeline, Command K is going to cut only that clip. So you could either in this situation do the Shift Command K or you can go over here to sequence and deselect selection follows playhead. And this is great for when you are cutting that A roll track, um, you can just use shift K to cut across all tracks and it will not auto select the top track by default. Specifically here on the side, it says that it can cook deviled eggs, it can cook soft boiled, hard boiled and omelets. Uh, the omelet one is what I'm a little suspicious about. So let's try it out. So in this case here, what I wanted to do is I want to cut out this pause right here. So I'll place my playhead where I want the cut to happen and I will press Q on my keyboard, the Q button, and that will cut everything from this previous cut point to the playhead, leaving only the words. Let's try it out. Just gonna go ahead and open it. Now I wanna cut out, I'm just gonna go ahead and open it because I'm opening it, so I don't need to actually say the words because you see them on the screen and it's also just a way to get through the video quicker so i'm just going to press q again to cut that out oh, the packaging is really beautiful it says great choice get to know your cooker look inside you'll find an envelope with everything you need to get started including quick start guide recipes and instructions so i'm going to press command k again to insert a cut and now i want to get rid of everything right here so I'm going to put my playhead right where I want to insert the cut and I want to get everything, get rid of everything from the playhead to the next cut point. So instead of everything before, I want to get rid of everything after. And that is the W command. So instead of pressing Q, I'll press W. And there we go. So we have our quick start guide. I think. No, this is just a thing about tagging them on Instagram. I'll press JKL to just go through this a lot faster. All right. This is a beautiful packaging, um, a recipe book. Very cool. So this is the recipe book every day. So this is the recipe book every day egg cooker. It has a lot of interesting recipes. Egg salad, eggs benedict, Egg salad. Benedict. Double eggs. Right. Is this also the is this book? Um, it looks like it might be. Eggs. All right. And is this also the... So you can see all of those cut points have now really been chopping up that video and compressing um, the amount of timing that it has. And you can see I have a lot more to go through. So let's go through that quickly and... We'll go to the next step. Here it is, here's that first cut I did. I managed to narrow it down from being 30 minutes long to being under nine minutes long. So now I can go through and I can refine the cut. 
right away I see a little bit of an issue on this top track. It's that the table is smaller than the frame size and you have all this extra stuff going on on the side. So I don't need that. I want to just punch in a little bit more. So I will go on that first clip, select it. I'll scale it up slightly. There we go. And I'll move it down a little bit. There we go. And now I can take the motion control. I can copy it. So command C and then I'll just select all of the clips that are magenta. So I'll left click, go to label, select label group that selects all the magenta clips on my timeline. So I didn't have to like zoom out and drag a marquee box. I mean, I could have, that's another way to do it. But if you don't want to do that, you can just select the label group and then I can paste those motion controls. So now it's everywhere. Another thing I can do instead of disabling the visibility of each of these video tracks is to just disable the clip entirely. So if I want to disable the clip, I just select it and I right click, I go to enable and I deselect that. And now the clip has been sort of grayed out. It's gone a little bit darker, which means that it's disabled and you can see the clip underneath it instead. Another way to do this is to select the clips and go to shift E and that will enable or disable the clips. So for now, let's disable them and see if we need to enable them at any future point. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool that I want to test out and unbox for you. So this is the everyday egg cooker from from Dash. I found it at Target and as someone who cooks a lot of eggs every single day, I thought that this may be able to help me um, with some of that. Maybe I'll place a cut here by going to Command K. I'll place a cut here by doing Command K and then I'll enable the top layer by going to Shift E and that'll switch the view to the top layer. Target and as someone who cooks a lot of eggs every single day. And then I'll do a Command K and I'll disable it. I thought that this may be able to help me um, with some of that. Specifically here on the side. So I said here on the side. So I'll do a cut here and then I'll play it and enable the second layer. It says that it can cook deviled eggs, it can cook soft boiled, hard boiled, and omelets. I'll do a Command K and then I'll take this layer that is on V2 and enable it. So now I have the side profile enabled and you can actually see what it says here is exactly what I'm talking about, which is pretty cool. But if I wanted to zoom in on it a little bit, I noticed that the scale of it is 50%, which means that this clip can actually be scaled up without losing any resolution because it's a 4K clip. So I can scale it up a little bit so that we see what I'm talking about, the four different ways that the egg cooker can cook eggs. Deviled eggs, it can cook soft boiled, hard boiled and omelets. Uh, the omelet one is what I'm a little suspicious about. So let's try it out. Now that I've gone through and refined the cut, I've been able to cut it down to a little bit over five minutes, which is perfect for this type of YouTube video. And as you can see, I'll mute all the tracks for now. And as you can see, it goes back and forth between the top angle and the side angle and the front angle. So it's a little bit more engaging and the angles really do depend on what I'm saying in that moment. You just pour that onto the heating plate. So now I will just lock the top in place and then press this button. For hard boiled, we have to wait 12 minutes. So, see you in 12 minutes. 
So there's a bunch of stuff that I want to add, including a bunch of B-roll and graphics. So first, let's add B-roll. B-roll is just additional footage that you might have shot that you want to put into your project. And for this project, I did shoot a bunch of separate B-roll of what all of the components are of this product, what the manual says. So let's go find that B-roll. That B-roll is here. It's in the folder cam B. And if you start looking at it, there it is. The close-ups and all of that. The only thing is all of the B-roll is shot in 59.94 frames per second. How do I know that? Well, here in the frame rate column, it literally says that, that it's 59.94 frames per second. However, my timeline, my sequence is in a different frame rate. If I go to sequence, sequence settings, you can see here the time base is 23.976 frames per second. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if I choose a section of this B-roll and I don't change the frame rate and I stick it into my sequence, it's not gonna be in slow motion. Not yet, right? So let's do it without changing the frame rate first. Let's select a good intro section, maybe from here, I'll say I, and this will be my O, in point and out point, and I'll go ahead and I'll drag just the video only. So I'll use the just video only button to drag it in here. So when I talk about what the cooker is, Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool that I want to test out and unbox for you. So this is the, actually I want to put it there. This is the Everyday Egg Cooker from Dash. I found it at Target. So you can see that it's not in slow motion, right? There's a little bit of jitter. If I want to smooth out that jitter, I have to use this clip in slow motion. And in order to use this clip in slow motion, I have to change the frame rate of it before I put it into my project here. So I'm going to delete that. And for all of the clips that are 59.94 frames per second, I'm going to go to the first one. Then I'm going to scroll down to the very last one so that they're all selected. I'm going to right click and go to modify interpret footage. And here it's going to ask me, can, do I want to assume a different frame rate? I'm going to say, yes, please assume the frame rate 23.976. And that is going to turn my frame rate from 59.94 to 23.976, effectively making this slow motion. So I'm going to say, OK. And now, no matter what I click, it's going to play back in slow motion. Slow motion usually irons out all of the little jitters that you have when you're shooting handheld. So because I was shooting handheld, I knew that this was okay to shoot in slow motion. So I'm going to go back and choose that section again, I to O, and then drag that in to here. You can see it's much longer now because it's in slow motion. So I will shorten it up and there we go. So this is the Everyday Egg Cooker from Dash. I found it at Target and as someone who cooks a lot of eggs. Now the way that I brought this b-roll clip into my project was by dragging the drag video only button, holding that and dragging it in. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it again remember is the comma or the dot. The dot shortcut is the override shortcut and the comma shortcut is the insert shortcut. But look what happens when I do it. So let's say I want to put this clip here. I'll delete this for now. Let's say I want to put it on track four, okay? And I use the comma shortcut to put it on track four. So technically this, right? it should go on track four. And I do comma, see what happens? It actually goes on track one, why? Well, 
because I had source patching enabled for track V1 and A1, source patching are these uh, blue highlights behind the track names here to the left. So this is called track targeting and this is called source patching. So if I wanted to put this clip from the source monitor onto V4, I should have source patched V4. So let's undo that. And instead of having the source patching here, I'll have it on V4 and A5. And then I'll press comma. But by pressing comma, I'm actually rippling everything else back, right? So unlike our previous example in our lesson with the tuna salad, where we wanted to insert things in between two clips, in this case, we actually want to insert this B-roll clip on top of everything. So instead of pressing comma, we're going to press period. Period. And now it goes on top. Let's do that a few more times. Eggs, it can cook soft. Go ahead and open it. Oh, the packaging is really beautiful. It says, great choice. Okay, right here, when I say it says great choice, maybe I don't want to use the top down. Maybe I want to use an insert clip from the B-roll. I know I have this beautiful insert clip where it does say great choice. So let me put that in instead. So I'll choose the in point. I'll go I. I'll choose the end point. I'll go O. And then I want to put it right there. So with my source patching on V4 and A5, I'll go period. And that'll put it in there. It says great I'll put it there. Full. It says great choice. Get to know your cooker. Look inside. You'll find an envelope with everything you need to get started, including quick. And then I will hide this one and I'll go back to my face. To get started including quick start guide, recipes, and instructions. So this is the... Now, here's something to think about is, are you going to be doing a jump cut? And a jump cut is like this, where the same framing is retained on either side of the cut, or like this. Instructions. So this is the recipe book, Everyday Egg Cooker. Maybe you don't want the jump cut, so a couple of different ways to avoid a jump cut. The first way is enable some other camera instead. So I'm gonna do shift E and I'm gonna enable the side camera. That's a way to get rid of the jump cut. So this is the recipe book. But that doesn't look very good, right? Another way to do it is to put B-roll over it. So I'm talking about the recipe book here, which means I can maybe insert B-roll of the recipe book. I. O, and then drag that in. That covers up the jump cut. So this is the recipe book, Everyday Egg Cooker. Another way to do it if you don't want to do that, so let's just uh, disable this B-roll clip for now, is if you are shooting something in 4K, you can always punch in on the 4K image, and that'll almost make it look like it is a second camera that is just a closer lens, and it'll hide that jump cut for you. So I'm going to select that clip, go to effect controls, and zoom in, and reframe a little bit. So now let's check out that jump cut, which is not a jump cut anymore. Instructions. So this is the recipe book, Everyday Egg Cooker. Smooth, right? Now, once you have all of your B-roll placed on V4, it's going to look a little bit like this. Recipes and instructions. So this is the recipe book, Everyday Egg Cooker. Egg salad, eggs benedict, deviled eggs. Here is the cooker itself. One thing that I found kind of weird on the packaging, it says it could cook up to seven eggs at a time. Who would ever cook seven eggs? 
Now, one thing that you might notice is that there are some inconsistencies, maybe some rough bits, some plosions, some pops in between each audio segment, right? Because I cut out um, all of these ums, all of the extraneous stuff, and there's really no transition in the audio. So like here, for example, six at a time, you heard that little breath at the end. Let's find another good example. Let's. Let's. Hear that right at the edge there? Right at the edge. There's a little inconsistency. So we can smooth all those out. All we need to do is go to effects here in the effects library and we're gonna find constant power, the constant power effect. And we're gonna drop it right in between these two clips. Now by default, the constant power effect is way, 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 way too long. So we are going to right click and go to set transition duration. And we are gonna set it over here. Right now it's, oh, three seconds, no, no. We're gonna set it to zero seconds and just two frames. It's gonna be the shortest, tiniest little effect, just two frames long over here. And now you can actually copy paste effects to other transition points. So if I copy it by clicking it and going to Command Copy, and then I go to the next one, Command V, okay, I pasted it, Command V, Command V, wow, that is tedious, right? Doing it a million times across this entire video. I wish there was an easier way to do it. Well, there is. You know how you can select clips by just dragging a marquee box? Well, you can select edit points by holding down command or control and dragging a marquee box. So now we have all these edit points selected and now we can just go command V to paste. That little tiny two frame transition across all of the audio. So now when we zoom in, you can see that little transition has been applied across all of the audio clips. Now let's quickly add a little bit of color. There is so much I can say about color. I can do an entire three hour lesson about it, but just for a little bit of basics, let's color correct each of the images from each of the cameras and then apply it across the entire camera. So for this one, let's find a good frame for our A camera, maybe ideally one where I'm looking at the camera. All right, that's the one. And I'll go to Window, Lumetri Color, pops up the Lumetri Color window, and we'll do a couple of things to make this better. First of all, I think it just needs a little bit more saturation. It's getting a little bit yellow here, so I'm going to take the temperature down. There we go, and it's getting a little green, so maybe make it a little bit pinker. And you can toggle this on and off because the Lumetri color effect has appeared in your effect controls. And if you press this effects button, you can actually toggle the effect on and off and see what it does. So here we go. You can see what I've done. I also want to maybe increase the shadows a little bit, brighten up the shadows, lower the blacks a little, increase the contrast. There we go. Let's see what that effect did. Oh yeah, much better. And then I want to, this blue is a little too blue. You know what I'm saying? I want it to be a little bit more magenta. So I'm gonna go into curves and in the hue versus hue curve, I'm gonna say, you know what? I want all the blue values right here so all of the values between these two points, let's make them a little bit more magenta. And there we go. And I can toggle it on and off by pressing this check mark right here just to check what it did. So it made all that blue magenta. You know, I'm very into magenta, clearly. So now that I have that done, I'll select that Lumetri color effect and I'll copy it by going to Command C. And then I'll go to all of the clips that are this cyan color, right? Because all of the cyan clips 
all of the blue clips here, it's technically the color is called iris, all of the blue clips are from the same camera, right? So I'll right click, I'll go to label, select label group, and that'll select all the blue clips. Now if I paste it to all the blue clips by going to command V, what'll happen is, yes, it will add it to all the blue clips, but then to the clip that it's already on, it's added it twice, right? Because I copy pasted it twice. So I'll just go ahead and delete one of them. Or what I can do, instead of doing that, I'll just undo and undo. So now it's still just on the one clip. I'll do the same thing again. I'll right click, go to label, select label group, and then I'll deselect the one that already has the color correction applied by going to shift and then clicking on it. So now that one's deselected and then I can go command V and paste that color correction across to all the rest of them. So you can see it's applied now to all of the camera A clips here. So for the camera B clips, these orange colored mango colored clips right here, what I wanna do is kind of match it right to the wide to camera A. So I'll go to comparison view, which is right here. And this is the clip that I'm trying to change. And this is the clip that I'm trying to match, right? So the clip that I'm trying to change, let's say is this one, this mango one. So I'll put my playhead there and that's the clip that is right here. That's the clip that I'm trying to apply the color correction to. And this is the clip I'm trying to match, but let me go to a wide. Let me find a wide version of it just for reference. Okay. So now with this mango clip, let's try to match it. We'll go to basic correction and I can already tell it's very warm compared to this clip. So I'll make the temperature cooler. I'll add a little bit more of that pink or tint, and that's already pretty close. I'll increase the exposure. Yeah, we're definitely getting there. I mean, that's a lot closer, so I can toggle it on and off to see how close I'm getting. I wanna take the highlights down a little bit so it's not as bright. I'll take the whites down so you can actually see the eggs. Increase the contrast as well and take down the blacks just a little bit. And that looks good to me. So I'll take that Lumetri color, command copy it. I'll go to the mango clip, right click, go to label, select label group, deselect the one I was working on, and then paste, command V, I'll paste that color correction across. And I'll do the same thing for the magenta clips, the overhead clips on V3. So this time I will place my playhead instead of over the mango clip, I'll place it over one of the magenta clips over here so that now I can match this to this. So I definitely know that I need a lot more contrast and a little bit more brightness. And again, I need it to be a little bit more on the cooler side. And there we go. Maybe take down the shadows a little bit and that looks close enough to me. So I'll take the Lumetri color, command copy it, right click, go to label, select label group, hold down shift while I deselect the one that already has the Lumetri color, and then command V to paste. And now for the B-roll, which are these light yellow clips, I actually colored them light yellow after the fact because they were from camera B. So originally they were mango over here, remember? So all I did was I selected them, right click, went to label and labeled them yellow so that they would be a little bit different for me. But here's the kicker though. I know that those clips are originally from camera B. So I can take camera B's color correction, the same color correction that was on the mango clips, go to Lumetri color, select that effect by going to command copy, copy that effect by going to command copy, then go to all of the yellow clips, right click, go to yellow select label group. So now I've selected all of the B-roll clips and command V. And now it's been applied to all the B-roll clips as well. And now let me get out of comparison view. 
I also want to add a music track to this and I'll do it in much the same way as the previous tutorial. I'll go ahead and go to Window, Essential Sound, and here in the sound search settings, I'll select my categories, my moods, and all of that, and I'll be right back. I found a music track, I added it here to A5, and I've also added some graphics. Um, this is what the graphics look like. First, we need something though, eggs. So we're gonna take, what do they call this? The boiling tray, put it on the plate. And those graphics were really easy to find. You just go to window, essential graphics, and here under Adobe Stock Free, you just type in whatever you need. So if you need that transition that looks like this, you just type in transition. And here's a bunch of transitions. So the one that I used was visual trends. All you have to do is drag it into your timeline and then adjust the colors and that's all. But we're not talking about graphics, we're talking about audio. So we have dropped this audio track and now the trouble is how do we get the audio track and the dialogue track to interact and talk with each other? How do we tell the program, hey, this is dialogue, hey, this is music, play nice. Well, let's select all of the dialogue here on track A4, go to Essential Sound, Edit, and in the Edit tab of Essential Sound, you have the opportunity to assign a type of audio. We're gonna assign this as dialogue, even though it's technically a monologue. <laughs> and here you can change, you can auto match the loudness, you can repair it, so if there's any noise or hissing or anything like that. You can add EQ, enhance the speech, change the clip volume. But first, let's also make sure that our music is selected as music. So I'm going to select the music, tag it as music. And now I can duck it against the dialogue, meaning when the dialogue gets louder, the music gets quieter and vice versa. So I'll select ducking. Duck against what? Duck against the dialogue. Here you can set your settings like sensitivity, duck amount, and fades. And then when you're done, click generate keyframes. If I wanted to create these keyframes myself, this is what it would look like. If I wanted to manually raise the level of the volume in this section, for example, right where the intro of the episode is, where I'm not talking, there's a gap in the talking, I would have to place those keyframes myself. So I would have to, on this volume line that goes through the middle of the music track while holding down command, insert a keyframe right where I kind of want that uh, increase to start, place a keyframe where I want the increase to end, place a keyframe where I want the decrease to start, and place a keyframe where I want the decrease to end, and then raise the volume line in the middle. So that's what this would sound like. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool that I want to test out and unbox for you. So this is the ever if I want that to be a little bit louder, I can move it a little bit up. Cool that I want to test out and unbox for you. But then I would have to go through everything and place those keyframes manually myself. And that takes a really long time. So instead of doing that, I'm going to undo those keyframes. Control Z or Command Z to undo. And I'm just gonna press generate keyframes and see what happens. As you can see, it has now added those little keyframes to points in the song that it feels that the music needs to rise when there's no talking. So let's see how well it did on its own. Today we have a special new tool that I want to test out and unbox for you. 
So this is, it did pretty good with detecting where those keyframes should be. I think it's a little bit quiet. So I can go over here to clip volume and raise the clip volume a little bit. New tool. The clip volume slider here will not affect the intensity of these keyframes, by the way. It'll just raise the entire clip volume. Tool that I want to test out. It's a little too much that I want to test out and unbox for you. So this is the everyday egg cooker. That sounds good to me. You can also change the clip volume in a couple of different ways. For example, if you wanted to change the volume of everything, all of the tracks here, you can go here in the master volume and expand this a little bit. And here also is a volume line that you can move up and down and that will change the master volume of all of the clips. If you wanted to add gain or take away gain to this clip, you could right click and go to audio gain. And here you can adjust the gain by adding or subtracting decibels. There's a lot of different ways to manipulate audio within Premiere Pro, and if you want a more detailed explanation of what all of these things do, then I highly recommend downloading my notes for the lesson. In there, you will get more detailed notes for things like color and sound and graphics so that you can really start using Premiere Pro on a more professional level. But as far as this tutorial, I hope that it has helped you discover a new program. I hope that it has helped you make it less daunting for you to jump into Premiere Pro and start playing around. Of course, if you don't have files to work with, you can literally take my files and work with them and have fun. And if you want even more tutorials from me, I do have a series called Tips and Tricks Tuesdays on the Adobe Care YouTube channel with so much more in-depth information and a lot of it is content specific. So if you want to edit a DIY video, if you want to edit an interview video, if you want to edit a video with graphics or a video that is very sound heavy, I have all of that information there. So do check it out. As far as for me, my social media links are Twitter, Valentina V, Instagram, Valentina.V, Feel free to connect with me there. And I hope that you have the best day and the best learning experience with Premiere Pro. Feel free to ask me any questions on social media. Bye. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special new tool that I wanna test out and unbox for you. So this is the everyday egg cooker from Dash. As someone who cooks a lot of eggs every single day, I thought that this may be able to help me with some of that. Specifically here on the side, it says that it can cook deviled eggs, it can cook soft boiled and omelets. I'm just gonna go ahead and open it. Oh, the packaging is really beautiful. It says, great choice. So this is the recipe book, egg salad, eggs benedict, deviled eggs. Here is the cooker itself. One thing that I found kind of weird on the packaging, it says it could cook up to seven eggs at a time. Who would ever cook seven eggs? I feel like if there's a dozen eggs in a carton, you would cook six at a time. Go ahead and open this up. I, I don't know what any of this is. This looks complicated. All right, I've unboxed it, but let's actually use it. First, we need something though. Eggs. So we're gonna take, what do they call this? The boiling tray, put it on the plate. Then we're gonna poke the bottom of the egg, like this, I guess. And then put it down. Poke this one too. Okay. I'm gonna put it down here. And then there are also measurements on the side of this cup. We want hard boiled. So we are gonna fill it up to that line. 
I don't know, some of it's dripping down. You just pour that onto the heating plate. So now I will just lock the top in place and then press this button. We have to wait 12 minutes. So see you in 12 minutes. I set those hard boiled eggs to cool. We're gonna crack them open later once they've cooled down a little bit, but for now, let's make an omelet. Here I have a full egg with one egg white. Let's go ahead and pour it in. I'm going to pour the water to the line that says omelet. And then again, just pour it uh, directly onto the hot plate. Definitely keep this still on it to not put the little omelet plate directly on the hot plate. And then we are going to put the top on, lock it, and press the button once again. I gotta say, it smells really, really good. What I like about it is that it is very fluffy, unlike the omelets that I make on my skillet. Let's have a little bit of a taste. It tastes pretty good, unlike cooking it on a skillet, obviously. It's not burned on the underside, so that's really nice. If you like a fluffy omelet, this is for you. Let's test the hard boiled egg too. All right, here it is, moment of truth. Perfectly hard boiled. Mmm, this is good. This is a legit tool. I really like it. It is super handy. And all you need is a little bit of water and a little bit of electricity for it to work. All right, that was my unboxing, first impressions, and review of the Everyday Egg Cooker. I hope you enjoyed it, learned something new. I would definitely give this an eight out of 10. If you would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel and leave me a comment down below about what other gadgets you would like me to review. Till next time, let's learn cooking together. Bye.